everybody. My name is Jim Nguyen. Uh, I'm here with OKCoin at Ape Marketing. Uh, thank you for everybody for uh, here this week. Uh, it's been a long week with uh, SF Blockchain. We have a, uh, a great panel by the team here that's put together, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, just a little background about OKCoin. Uh, OKCoin started in 2013 in China, and uh, in 2017, um, as you know, China really changed the, the rules. Uh, as of early this year, OKCoin is now uh, based in San Francisco, and we are going to do a pretty massive expansion in the next uh, three to six months, so keep an eye out for us. Um, we have more events coming in the next uh, few weeks, so uh, if you guys are not on the invite for next week, uh, let us know and we'll put you on. Uh, in the meantime, I will put you to Cecilia. Oh, hi, this is Cecilia. I represent of OK Blockchain Capital. So in the short, we want to invest in good project to make the ecosystem better and healthier. And uh, in the end, we want to become a bridge to link China and the US. Awesome, thanks. Uh, my name is Brian. I work at Republic. Uh, we are a SEC registered and FINRA licensed funding portal. And our goal is to really uh, democratize investing to allow people of all backgrounds to invest in cool blockchain based projects and also uh, standard uh, equity projects as well. So um, I want to kind of give a round of applause for Lindsay for helping to organize this. <laughs> And also uh, Cecilia and the rest of the OK Coin team for letting us host this event in this really awesome office. And shout out to Tim for uh, logistics as well. Thanks, Brian. Hi, my name is Lindsay Mall. I am the CEO and founding partner of Luna Capital. We are located in San Francisco. We invest in next generation protocols, emphasizing on DAGs. And all three of these are DAGs, but they're all different. So we'll go forward from there and uh, security type things as well. Miles isn't here yet. There's a lot of traffic. He's been in traffic for like an hour. So we're going to go ahead and get started. But they are one of the largest and top premier firms in Australia. And they invest in early stage projects and blockchain. And they've really made a, a sound in this space as well. So he'll be here in just a second. And you guys can meet him later. We're going to get started. This panel is called Next Generation Protocols. And I guess I'll get started with um, asking a little bit about, I guess you guys can do intros. And yeah, go for it. We'll start with Kyle. Sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Kyle Armour with Hedera Hashgraph. Uh, my background is in marketing, but uh, kind of built the whole uh, first community push and uh, then kind of transitioned into fundraising and now uh, leading up kind of the liquidity uh, exchanges, market makers, OTC desks. Uh, we have a distributed ledger technology consensus algorithm that's built on a DAG, as, as Lindsay said. Um, it maintains a property called asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. It's extremely fast and, and fair, and uh, that's called Hashgraph. And then uh, we have a public ledger called Hadera, which is using the Hashgraph algorithm, comes with a, a governance model that is uh, very interesting, and uh, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my name is uh, Shachaf Bar Geffen. I come from uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. It's pretty far away. Uh, with me is a guy from my team, our CRO. I am a CEO in uh, Cody. My background is uh, I've been an entrepreneur for the past 15 years. I've uh, co-founded a few companies, uh, sold two companies, um, and I'm with uh, Cody since early 2017. Um, what we do in Cody is that we are a next generation protocol. Um, and we are optimized for payments and stable coins. So we are working with enterprises, publishers, governments, and developers to uh, build payment networks and uh, issue stable coins. We are um, super laser focused on, on that market, and uh, that helps us um, bring out a lot of advantages and, and performances in how our uh, chain is optimized. So, um, so this is what we do. Um, hello. My thing on? Oh, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Wyatt. I'm uh, the chief technologist at Constellation Labs. Um, we are a uh, open source DAG protocol um, that is uh, focused on, on uh, tapping into unused compute resources and uh, sort of creating um, like a decentralized uh, cloud, uh, very similar to what you'd see in AWS. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, just you know, through our um, approach to application integration, which is a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about that today. Great. 
Yeah, so I want this panel to be pretty educational. You can learn about DAGs and then learn about each individual project here. But first, I want to open up the stage for all of you guys to answer this question. Uh, what are the major limitations of blockchain and what is a DAG versus blockchain first? I know DAGs are all different, but not many people, even engineers I know, know what a DAG is, which stands for a directed acyclic graph. And I guess I'll let you start, uh, Wyatt. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess just how do we differ from a traditional linear blockchain? Um, so uh, the term that we use uh, at Constellation is to describe ourselves as a like non-linear protocol. Um, so a traditional blockchain is um, actually kind of, it's blocking. Uh, it, essentially every single node has to process every uh, bit of information in serial. Um, and what that means is that there is no parallelism in your distributed system. Um, so it, as many no the many nodes that join the network actually tend to make it even slower. Um, this is a huge huge issue that a lot of uh, developers and, and engineers ran into, um, you know, probably about 10 years ago, um, when the notion of horizontal scalability became, um, I guess, kind of uh, the focal point of how we're going to fix backends. Um, so yeah, DAGs are essentially just sort of the evolution of uh, a cryptographic consensus protocol into something that is horizontally scalable. Uh, so you know, this this approach is something that could actually be integrated into a like backend um, that you know, with the type of um, performance you'd expect from like a consumer uh, application or something um, as big as like the you know, like a big data type application. So I would add that um, you know we're living in a connected world, and and we are expecting um, high scalability and low transaction costs for for most things, and 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 DAG actually does that, and blockchain just can't. Um, now the example I want to give um, you know in layman words uh, to what DAG is and how consensus is achieved is um, just think of um, P2P file sharing. Right. If you are looking for the latest episode, and and don't because it's illegal. But if you are looking for an episode of something and it's very popular, then it will be very easy uh, to get, uh, you know, um, a lot of um, kilobytes per second. Right. And but if we were all to go to um, to uh, to Fox Sports and 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 look at the latest uh, football game, and everybody was doing it in the same times, it will be very slow. So that is maybe uh, one way to see DAG versus um, uh, blockchain. As more transactions are added to a cluster or a tangle or, or to how you build your data structure in DAG, it becomes faster, uh, unlike uh, blockchain. Two other things, two other properties of DAG that are very good um, would be around how fair DAG is, because there is no mining and you don't need supercomputers and, and become part of a, a of a mining pool um, to gain something from the system. Anybody with a laptop can, can run a node. Um, and it's actually more responsible to the environment uh, if you care about these sort of things. And, um, and I think DAC has a lot of advantages um, because of that. Yeah, and just to kind of summarize, I mean, those were two really good uh, explanations. But uh, you know, the Hashgraph algorithm is using a gossip protocol. We're just kind of like randomly pinging each other, and we get to a point where we all come to an agreement on, on the ordering of transactions, essentially. So it's this simultaneous kind of communication. It builds up, and then we can analyze that previous communication to then um, you know, achieve hundreds of thousands of transactions per second instead of the, you know, obvious limitations that we're finding in proof of work where we're stuck to 5, 10, 20 transactions per second. So, and we also, as he mentioned, you know, have fairness properties where, and of course, proof of work, um, a miner could ignore your transaction. He can decide where it goes within a block. We have uh, complete order and time and timestamps on every event, which allows, uh, you know, new use cases like auctions and, um, you know, um, uh, exchanges and even like MMOs potentially in, in the long future. So, uh, games will be an interesting use case, I think, on, on Hashgraph. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, Wyatt, would you say that DAGs are a blockchain killer or that they're complementary to blockchain? I think that's such a controversial thing. A lot of engineers have a lot of questions around it. What is your insight on that? I think that um, 
DAG protocols are kind of the living embodiment of uh, Metcalf's law. Um, essentially, uh, you know, the only way uh, that we'll ever be able to really extract value from all of our of our tokens and our different protocols is to find a way to interoperate with them. Um, and DAG protocols seem to be the fundamental underlying architecture that will allow that. Um, so that's kind of a focal point in how our application support works. Um, and uh, yeah, basically the ability to integrate with any other type of protocol. Um, so to answer your, specifically your question, I don't think that. I think that every protocol has its specific uh, use case. And uh, what we'll see in the future is the ability to share and send value across protocols. Um, and there will be some natural, you know, um, I don't know, uh, effect where people decide what chain lives based upon its actual utility. Yeah, I think, and some of you guys have some different answers as well. I'd love to hear your insight to you. Well, I, I think basically um, same way uh, TV didn't kill radio. Um, I don't think usually new technologies don't kill previous technologies. In some cases they do, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody has a laser disc at home, but uh, um, of course you do. <laughs> uh, but, but then, um, I, again, I, I, I don't subscribe to the cookie cutter approach, right? There won't be just one protocol that does everything. We'll have specific protocols doing specific okay. things. And DAG is just there, you know, for um, high throughput, low transaction costs. And, and, and I think that, that makes a lot of sense in, in where we are right now. But um, looking into the future, I think there is, uh, we are very early on to uh, decide what we kill. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add to that. I mean, a lot of people consider like Bitcoin like gold, right? Um, there's, there's certainly uh, properties that are, that are uh, great um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, its fungibility, its portability, its durability. I don't think we're going to see um, Bitcoin disappearing anytime soon. I think that use case will, will, uh, will last, but as they mentioned, you know, it's, uh, the DAGs are offering um, a lot of the scalability, um, you know, answers and, and will offer new use cases um, and those others uh, may stay around, so. Yeah. So I see a lot of uh, new protocols coming out and obviously many blockchains and it seems like a lot of the blockchain protocols are very similar. When I look at DAGs, I see that there's so many differences in it and there are a lot more things that they can do. Uh, can you guys talk about how you all are unique and um, how you guys all reach consensus so that people can differentiate you all? And I guess we can start with Kyle. Sure. So um, essentially in Hashgraph, uh, we are using a protocol called Gossip About Gossip. Um, essentially, gossip is just pinging a random node and telling that node what you know that it does not know. That's used in computer science, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. The the additional thing here is that we're we're going to tell you also about that actual gossip. That's the gossip about the gossip. So we're going to add the hash of the last person that we talked to, and by doing that, every node will will be able to uh, build up a picture, which is the hash graph. And by actually analyzing that hash graph, we can input that data into these old voting algorithms that go 35 years back in computer science. And, and actually, um, these were never deployed because they were so transactionally inefficient. It required every node to, com to, to talk to every other node. It was N squared work, never deployed. But Lehman, uh, our CTO and, and, the, and the inventor of Hashgraph, actually solved that. So we're able to, um, you know, maintain that asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance and, and hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Well, I'm just thinking how to explain our consensus mechanism without boring everybody to death. So um, let's talk about trust. Okay. Um, Payments and trust are interrelated, right? It's, it's right there on the dollar bill in God we trust. Um, if we had trusted everybody and knew everybody, there would be no need for payment systems, there would be no need for banks or anything because we would just pay along and then everything was easy. We need banks because banks um, tell us who has uh, balance and, who, and, and how balance are uh, moved. And, um, and cryptocurrencies are actually the first technology out there that is able to do that without the need of a, of a bank or a third party to tell you, yeah, you can trust this. If you trust math, and you should, it's, it's a good idea, then uh, cryptocurrencies um, uh, solve that trust issue. Our 
model goes beyond that, right? Because this is the first level of trust, just balance. But what about behavior? So let's say um, I'm, I'm paying Lindsay for something with a cryptocurrency, uh, but she never sends me the product. So she's acting in a, and, and I'm not saying you do, but she theoretically acting in an in a, a untrustworthy behavior, right? So our protocol goes to that realm and actually assigns trust scores to all participants of the network, uh, consumers, merchants, node operators, arbitrators, double spend prevention operators, and, and whatnot. And with these scores, the um, new transactions that are added to the clusters actually tip in to other transactions with similar trust scores. And when you look at our cluster, you will see trust chains, chains with transactions with similar trust scores. And when enough trust is accumulated on a chain, a transaction is confirmed and populated, and, and, and that is how we um, achieve consensus um, non-professionally. Well, where do we begin? Um, so as I mentioned before, Constellation is a little different. Um, our approach is, um, how do I put it? In a traditional blockchain application, or rather a traditional blockchain-based application integration platform, uh, which I believe is how Ethereum is currently positioning itself, uh, and we do as well, at least on our you know, GitHub page and, and you know, other places, um, there is some notion uh, of an acceptance uh, of the fact that one has to communicate with this chain, uh, take data from this chain, and bring it back. Um, and somehow we accept that this data within that pipeline of you know going onto the chain and back on um, is accepted as true. And uh, that really couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, there is an inherent issue with the ability to integrate with current applications uh, with any type of smart contract platform that I'm currently aware of. And that is kind of why we created Constellation. Uh, Constellation is different because we directly embed in your existing application. Uh, literally, you will take an import statement and a two-line piece of code, put it in your app, and voila, your app has become a Constellation node. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit different, but um, I assure you, it, it's kind of like the, uh, the piece that we were missing in order to add a true cryptographic security layer to um, our applications. Um, and uh, in this sense, it really allows us to have like you know a, a full, um, I think I would use the term um, maybe provenance over the flow of data th uh, in and out of the network. Uh, what I mean by that is that Constellation, by living inside of your application, um, can actually directly um, become a part of the infrastructure of your application. Um, so in that sense that I mentioned before, uh, that we are aiming to become something akin to like a, de a decentralized cloud computing infrastructure, um, although I would not say that we are like you know, becoming AWS, um, what we would really love to do is connect uh, all of the world's like infinite many different APIs, uh, whatever is comprising the billion dollar market caps of Segment IO and MuleSoft, um, with some type of tokenization layer. Um, and so uh, without getting to the actual technical details of that, I will mention we do it also slightly differently in the sense that there is no staking in how our consensus is performed. Um, everything is based upon actually truly earned reputation. Our entire, met our entire uh, consensus model is meritocratic uh, from the get-go. Um, and there is really no way to kind of game the system in that regard. Um, how do we achieve consensus? So there is uh, a actually um, like an actual consensus protocol that can be kicked off um, in the background uh, as we are continually processing transactions in parallel. However, uh, we achieve uh, something, uh, basically we achieve uh, consensus through eventual consistency, uh, very similarly to how uh, NKN and uh, I believe the Avalanche protocol um, are, are proposing as well. Uh, it's, it's sort of very similar to us with the way we've used cellular automata. Um, over time, as transactions are continuously uh, observed, we can trust on the compounding observations to understand what actually happened throughout the network. Um, so, you know, these types of, uh, you know, these approaches um, are all implemented uh, using a dynamic partitioning screen scheme, um, which is central to how we solve scalability. 
so each three of those components are directly uh, contained inside that dynamic partitioning scheme. So solving consensus is actually uh, like also solving uh, the scalability problem in the same way that one would rebalance a distributed hash table. So if you're thinking about uh, you know, any type of uh, torrent system, um, we essentially keep track of you know, Cedar and Leecher ratios, uh, use those as well as um, you know, nodes joining and leaving the network in order to um, you know, make sure that data is correctly hosted. Uh, you know, we, aren't, we aren't sending tons of data over the network. We're trying to solve that data locality issue. Um, but at the same time, it is also performing uh, like a consensus operation. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we, we sort of found that each one of those three pillars were kind of the, the solution to each other's problems. Um, and not only that, um, they've all been solved before in tools you're currently using uh, all the time, whether it be you know, a torrent system uh, or a big data platform like Spark or Hadoop. Um, so I guess it's a little bit of a, a, bit of a dump on us. Seems so, simple. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you. Thank you. Great detail. Um, Kyle, I want to start with you. So. There's this huge misconception that Hashgraph is closed source, but I know you guys are open for review. Can you talk more about that distinction and what it means and to kind of debunk that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yes, as she mentioned, we are not closed source. It's, it's open review, which means the code will be fully transparent. It's, it's much, you don't have to talk to us. No license is required. Um, it'll be, you know, much like Ethereum. People will be developing apps, uh, dApps. We already have, uh, you know, 120 uh, in, in the roadmap right now in the pipeline. Um, but what that basically allows is a, uh, a legal mechanism to prevent forks and to provide stability. Um, you know, it, it, it's possible people will, will try to go and fork the chain and do that, but we don't really foresee the, you know, enterprise or, or dApps that are really taking, um, you know, stability with, with a high priority um, you know, going and in, in using a, a ledger that is, um, you know, violating a patent. And uh, I, I mean, we'll acknowledge that uh, there are certainly, you know, two different kinds of developers out there. There's certainly the kind that, uh, you know, uh, occasionally will tinker with the consensus algorithm, maybe submit changes there. Um, and, and, you know, if they don't agree with the roadmap set forth, then uh, you know, they'll fork and they'll, they'll do their own ledger and run, your, run their dApp there. Um, but then there's another kind of developer out there who is, um, you know, just really looking for a stable, um, a stable ledger with, you know, a really strong governance body and an extremely fast and secure uh, ledger. And that's what we're offering. Great. I know you guys have a bunch of projects being built on top of Hashgraph right now. Can you talk a little bit more? about that and what type of things can be built on top of Hashgraph and maybe it's everything or what types of things you really want to be built on top of Hashgraph? Yeah, sure. I mean, like I said, yeah, there's over 120 that are, that are building. I mean, that's everything you can imagine in the space. Um, you know, we're certainly pushing the uh, applications that are geared towards micropayments. Uh, at launch, we're expecting, uh, you know, we're, we did all our tests, and it's a, around 100 bytes uh, for a, a cryptocurrency transaction. Uh, we're estimating the fees on that to be somewhere around a thousandth of a penny. Um, you know, when the network gets full maturity, uh, potentially a, a millionth of a penny. Um, so we're, we're certainly looking for those kinds of use cases. Um, we're doing a hackathon next week as well, uh, where we already have a thousand participants and we're doing our first uh, annual developer conference, so. Thank you. Uh, Shahaf, so what are the ideal enterprise use cases given the properties of CoT? And I know that you guys have a few partnerships going on and some things in the making right now. Can you talk more about that as well? Um, yeah, look, any company that I've managed um, in history, like in three months, had more users to it than the entire usage of cryptocurrencies uh, to date. So like, I think we, um, we need to look at adoption and this is what, what we are aiming to. So the sort of partnerships that we are dealing with are enterprises that have uh, tens, and tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users. So we've signed in um, either major enterprises like Iron Source, you know, that sees about 400 million users uh, every month uh, we hopefully will sign in Wix to build Wix payments. 
Um, we have signed in major um, payment processors like Processing.com, uh, point of sale devices like Orme Cash, um, and then a bunch of uh, stable coins and, and payment apps like PumaPay and, and whatnot. So the way I see adoption is, uh, one, we are aiming to everyday behaviors like payments. Uh, two, we are um, looking to partner with where users are actually are right now. Like if you wanted to open, if you wanted to open a lemonade stand, you wouldn't put it in the desert. You would go to to a road where people are actually are right now. So you wouldn't have to deal with that. So this is what we're looking to do. So we will probably, I, I dare predict that in a year's time we'll have a lot of users using our platform and that would be newbies to cryptocurrencies because they'll have no idea they're dealing with cryptocurrencies because technology, good technology is like magic. They'll just be operating on the network because it makes sense for them. Um, so this is the sort of partnerships we are uh, looking at and what we've signed in uh, to date. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question before we close up, but uh, Wyatt, I know you were telling me about how you guys want to work with private and public chains. Can you talk about how you see the future for cross-platform interoperability and some projects that you want to work with and that you've signed on? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, interoperability is kind of uh, the focal point of our uh, approach to application support. Um, and uh, I'd like to use this time to also mention that we're really excited that we've just officially joined Hyperledger. Um, so uh, yeah, we're you know going to be integrating uh, you know immediately with probably Interledger, I think. Uh, I've been looking directly at Quilt um, and to contribute there and create something akin to a parachain. Um, so that's actually probably going to be on our roadmap. But um, regardless of that, um, yeah, specifically private public chains, absolutely. Um, so enterprises uh, themselves, either or maybe even your own self as an individual developer or individual, uh, you might want to have some type of a private chain. Uh, there's definitely uh, huge issues with privacy laws, HIPAA people in America, also the big one in Europe. I can't remember the, the acronym right now. Um, but that's definitely a, a use case. How on earth uh, is it going to be possible for people to actually derive value from some type of a private blockchain and connect it to um, like the public ecosystem? Um, and the answer, at least in terms of Constellation's framework, is through the notion of a parachain. Um, as people try to you know, want to actually tokenize some notion or unit of value, um, there needs to be some ability to translate that that doesn't have to go on an exchange. Um, there are a lot of nuances to this, regardless of cross-chain atomic swaps, there is the data normalization issue. Um, and um, yeah, basically by lumping up uh, the requirements of what a private chain tries to maintain, uh, keep us private, uh, and create some type of a public interface that can be, uh, that can connect to that private chain, um, you can achieve interoperability uh, within some type of a public network. So if I had a private chain over here and I created a parachain that connected to that private chain over here, through that parachain, I could communicate with a greater ecosystem of other types of protocols. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's pretty much just one use case, but uh, in general, uh, I'd also like to take this as uh, in one second to just talk a little bit about the, our, our shift away in, the, in this entire space from the FAT protocol. Um, as we've noticed that there is a huge issue uh, with processing transactions and data in serial, uh, it's kind of antithetical to what a distributed system actually is. Um, an ecosystem of parachains uh, that has also been proposed by Pocotat um, is kind of like, um, how would I put it, the uh, logical solution to this issue. Uh, basically, if you have a token or a use case for tokenization, it should exist as its own parallel separate blockchain. Whether it's a blockchain or DAG, it should be processing uh, its own data in its own world. However, in order to actually achieve the true value of uh, I don't know what our space is trying to do. There needs to be some ability for those values to, to communicate. Um, so the original approach uh, you know, relied upon uh, uh, chain executable code, but it also turned uh, each one of those chain executable code um, tokens, ERC20s or what have you, um, it, it basically chained them all to, uh, chained, uh, them all to uh, one 
database. Um, and uh, that's, that's a huge problem. I mean, we, we saw what happened with CryptoKitties last year. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd just like to say that I really think, and I mean, we're going to be hopefully be a living embodiment of uh, the fact that this parachain ecosystem is the way in which um, the, the, you know, the future is, is going. So thank you. Great, guys. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie, do we have uh, 30 seconds more for an experiment? Uh, sure, go for it. Good. So um, <laughs> we're playing with, uh, with game theory now because we are um, um, trying to figure out something around dispute resolution in, in payment systems. So we're trying to reach what is called the shelling point. Um, so I would like you to take 10 seconds to try and think of the following. Let's say I want to meet you in a certain city and you know the date, but you don't know the time or the place where I'm about to meet you. Um, take 10 seconds to think where would you meet me. You don't know the time, you don't know the place. So, <laughs> no. So how okay. many... <laughs> Good. So um, how many of you thought noon time? I see. And how many of you would meet me in a like the central train station. I see. Okay, thank you. Wait, what? <laughs> You've all failed miserably. No. No, the outcome is um, when you're trying to, the shelling point is where people um, try to expect what other people would expect of them uh, uh, to expect, actually. So uh, this is how equilibrium is rich when people can't communicate around results. Actually, most people would think uh, noontime in the center of the city in the information center. But you're not average people. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great closing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you awesome. So hello, everyone. My name is Ching Kai, and I'm the co-founder of uh, Stereo Network. So Stereo Network is a uh, layer to scaling, uh, uh, layer to scaling uh, platform on top of ex existing blockchains like Ethereum and Definity. So where everyone can build up their decentralized uh, applications that can scale to uh, millions of transactions per second and also has almost uh, instant finality. So the basic idea of uh, off-chain scaling is like you offload most of the transactions or the state transitions to the off-chain while only resulting to the blockchain when there's some dispute or you need to settle the state onto the blockchain. Because we believe that the, the core value of the blockchain itself should be the generation of trust instead of handling every detail like state transitions. And uh, just like uh, last weekend in the Ethereum uh, San Francisco Hackathon, we just released our like uh, first version of Testnet and SDK. And we also released our like uh, uh, two applications on the Android platform that sh uh, showcase the uh, applications that could be uh, built, in, uh, built with the uh, option scaling solutions. One is the uh, option instant payment. The other is uh, off-chain game for playing common core game with each other and betting with each other. So. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm the head of product for the Marconi protocol and we are a blockchain and networking protocol uh, that enables smart contracts for network packets. So what this means is you can uh, use these smart contracts to develop apps that can make your internet communication more secure, more private. Um, you can help shift from a world where all networking infrastructure is based on hardware, which is really expensive and cumbersome to manage and shift to a software-based model. And then additionally, you can decentralize how you get your internet co connectivity. So you don't always have to go to provide like Comcast uh, for your internet con connectivity and you can get it from your peers. So hi, uh, my name is Hai Chao. I'm from Nervos team, N-E-R-V-O-S, and uh, we are based in China. And we are trying to make the, uh, a layer one blockchain that we think it will be the best choice for all the layer two solutions. And it's called Nervos CKB, the common knowledge base. And the basic idea is that we at Novos we envision the future of the fundamental protocol for the crypto economy is going to be going to have a layered architecture, and you're going to have a layer that use blockchain to provide security and the trust for all the other layers. And as we all may know, that uh, the, the cost of the trust is pretty expensive and it's very slow. And what we are trying to do is to make the best use of it and provide it to the layer two solutions. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Hey everyone, I'm TF, co-founder of Texan Network. Uh, 
our project Taxa Networks is, is a layer two network and we're providing a new kind of smart contract platform that we move the smart contract from on-chain to off-chain. And we pro by doing so, we provide the data, ri data rich, computational intensive and privacy preserving business logics for the future dApps and blockchains. Thank you. Great introductions. Um, so I guess my first question to you all would be, how, how do you envision your go-to-market strategies and adopting or, or getting more developers to adopt your platform? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so basically, uh, we recently released uh, the remote attestation functionality. Uh, we did a pull request to the Boink network. Uh, so a little bit of uh, introduction to the Boink network. Uh, Boink is the largest grid computing, uh, a volunteer based grid computing network in the world with uh, over 700,000 nodes uh, across the globe. Uh, we deployed our function, uh, we, you know, a SGX based uh, functionality onto Boink uh, so that, you know, right now, Boeing supports Android, uh, Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows, and then we support this fun small functionality of using um, SGX so that there's no uh, redundancy anymore in, in verifying the entire progress of the computing. Um, we are already exposed uh, to 60,000 users on, uh, on the Boeing network. Uh, and then, so we consider users as our you know, supplier of uh, computational power uh, and then there's also a uh, demand uh, you know, for computation power. We're looking at um, uh, industries who are you know, very you know, data hungry, very com compute hungry, but also lacks uh, in, you know, those infrastructures, uh, for example, oil and gas industries, uh, or uh, we see a lot of um, medical industries uh, very you know, hungry for uh, compute resources. Yeah, I think like uh, for the uh, for any any kind of like layer two solution projects, I think uh, uh, getting the developers on board and to using your technology is a kind of like a, a painful stuff. Yeah, uh, because basically uh, unlike the the layer one like uh, technology to use a layer two uh, scaling solutions, you basically it's not just about writing a smart contract. Uh, instead, uh, you need to handle a lot of like uh, option stuff. Basically, you need to uh, build in the entire set of like infrastructure. For example, to manage your local state, to manage the communication protocols, and uh, to decide when to dispute on chain. And also, you also need to like uh, write your own game logic and also the smart contract part. So this is kind of like a very painful process for developers. So, so at the Cilla Networks, we hope to like abstract all this kind of stuff into into the concept called COS, which is the uh, Cellular operating system. So if we think of like uh, today's like uh, blockchain, it's, like, it's just like uh, hardware, okay? And uh, uh, serial network is just like the Windows or the Linux on top of the existing blockchains. We will abstract all of this kind of state management, communication protocol for the developers. And the developers just need to know, okay, uh, how to like uh, send state, how to exchange state, and uh, how to send a payment based on their certain, uh, certain conditions. Yeah, and last week in the Ethereum San, Fran uh, San Francisco, like a hackathon, we, uh, we, we, we also like uh, uh, see several uh, projects that using our Cedars SDK. Uh, some of the, some of the, like the, the option prediction market, and some of them like some, uh, derive some like uh, uh, financial derivatives of gas phase. I think they are all very interesting ideas that come out of the, the, the option scaling solutions. Yeah, and uh, I, I think like uh, also the, the, the layer two solution is also kind of like the, the cornerstone for any kind of decentralized applications to, to hit mass adoptions. Yeah, because like if you look at today's internet scale like applications, we will see like um, uh, uh, every second there will be like uh, two millions of emails exchanged around the world and there will be like uh, almost uh, uh, 50 terabytes of data exchange on the internet. So in order to like uh, uh, hit this kind of like a uh, scale, I think uh, uh, simply uh, improving the, uh, the, the efficiency of the layer one solution is not enough because essentially the, the bot performance bottleneck of every uh, uh, blockchain or consensus algorithm is no better than a system with just a single node. So it's bottlenecked by the capacity of the uh, processing speed of single node. So we think like uh, by using our option, uh, the, uh, the, the user experience could be uh, greatly uh, improved. 
So, uh, so if you try out our like uh, sample app for playing the the Gomoko game, uh, uh, you, you you will see like actually the the user experience will be very very smooth. It's like it's not like you you set your play stone and wait for two minutes and uh, the another uh, another player will make another move. So that's a painful process. Yeah. So uh, by the way, if you happen to have an Android phone, you can go to get dot .app to try out our Gomoko play games. Yeah, so you know, building any protocol, it's really important to get engage with the developer community, especially when you're creating a platform like this. So that's really where we've invested a lot of our time. You know, we spent most of our efforts trying to reach out and uh, drive this type of engagement. We've, we're really excited that we've got over 5,700 people that have signed up for our mailing list to get early access to our SDK. So all of our efforts right now are really designed to develop resources to support this group of people uh, when we launch our test net in the, in the next couple months. So we've been spending a lot of time to, um, building forums for them to really engage and get a lot of support from the engineering team. And then also focused a lot on building a rich suite of reference applications because we want to be able to show our developer community what can you do with this platform? What are the incredible applications that you can build with just a few lines of code to do the types of things that previously you needed really expensive hardware to do? Because we're trying to build a software platform to develop these same types of applications. So we really want to inspire our community with what they can build. Oh, s sorry. Uh, so, um, at Nervos, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're trying to build a layer one block public blockchain that is optimized for the layer twos. So in that sense, we are mostly trying to have partnerships with layer two projects, uh, such as so far we have been in uh, contact with Seller, and for the rest of you guys, I'm going to get your contacts after the panel for sure. And uh, at the same time, we are, trying, we are building a layer two solution ourselves, it's called Nervos App Chain. So it's like a application chain, a high performance application chain. And uh, along with that, we are building uh, developer products like uh, smartphone wallet, uh, blockchain explorer, and SDKs, and all the development tools around these uh, layer two solutions. Uh, just to get uh, know our developers uh, better. And the, on the other hand, our team has backgrounds, pre previous uh, experience in uh, other fields in the uh, blockchain industry, such as mining pool. We, we used to build the, uh, we were involved in the building of the second largest uh, Ethereum mining pool, the Spark pool. And uh, also we had built the, uh, the first open source, the, uh, the first open source exchange. It's called PCO. And our founder, Mr. Jian Xie, was a core developer in the Ethereum Foundation. And he was involved in the first version of the development of uh, Casper. So uh, in conclusion, we have a very broad uh, connections in this, uh, in this field and we are trying to just reach out more to, to, get, to, to try to uh, make the best of us, yes. Okay, I'll start with the go-to-market strategy and from a relatively different angle. So the Texas team are most of, uh, former entrepreneurs and uh, most of us have particip participated in early stage startup before. So from day one, uh, Texas team try to solve, uh, find out one, uh, one answer to a problem. That is, uh, how can we bring more real-world adoptions for public blockchains? And uh, we, we actually went to talk with a lot of uh, businesses and find a very interesting demanding that, uh, that uh, will make Texas product and uh, technology today. So uh, we talked with uh, several startups and we find the uh, demanding that is, uh, for example, one startup, they want to buy some data from several, uh, several vendors, and each vendor have a huge database that they can buy from. But they, don't, they can't afford too much data. They only want to buy some value, the most valuable data which existed in the, in the joint set of all the databases. For example, suppose a user has registered on all the e-commerce websites. He must be a very valuable user. And he asked me, you are doing blockchain. Can blockchain solve this? So, and we found out Blockchain usually to used to solve the trust issue by providing a trustless third party. However, these third public blockchains today usually cannot be that third party due to two reasons. First, privacy. You can't use this Ethereum to handle any privacy. Second one is about performance. Not only the network performance, but also the vertical performance. For example, even 1,000 data cannot be processed on today's smart contract platform. So after this, 
we we find our uh, mar uh, we find our initial initial uh, problem in the market, and we then further develop our technical solution and then product solution. Uh, so. Uh, Go back to the uh, go to market strategy. So we are facing taxa network will aim for the problem for two markets. First, we use the new technologies to solve all the problems. As I already said, we handle we solve the problem to in the data industry, in the uh, in the credit uh, in the fintech industry, and uh, you know we will never need to split the usage right and ownership right of your data and. Uh, our uh, our private private smart contract can definitely solve that. And the second part of our market is on using new technologies to solve new problem, which I mean is we may we provide p new possibilities for the future D apps, which can handle you know uh, a much stronger vertical performance for smart contract uh, with more time resources and space resources and privacy preserving. And also uh, I. Um, I totally agree with what uh, Seller founder and the Nervous founder has said. Uh, as a layer two, the, public, the other blockchain infrastructures are not your competitor, but your partners. And uh, 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 what, your, what layer two is valuable is, uh, is uh, you can actually bring your uh, developer base to other ecosystems. And that's also what we're doing. And currently, we already have many of those partners that will be announcing soon. Uh, something yeah. okay so another very interesting thing you know I've been talking with a lot of people over the past few months uh, so you know they said you know I, about three months ago I, I heard from someone you have to go mobile right because uh, before we were only supporting um, Intel SGX based um, you know PC users uh, you know we did some uh, research on uh, on trust zone we found a solution uh, and then we were you know just we're working on an application on um, Android right now, so this application is pretty interesting. So uh, you plug into the power of your uh, Android phone overnight, uh, and then uh, your 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 processing power is automatically uh, you know generated to uh, a cancer research uh, institute, uh, and then uh, you will be uh, rewarded uh, our um, our testnet token, but you know will be eventually converted to the to the to our mainnet token. Um, so I think you know this is a, a very you know essential way of uh, getting you know real customers uh, to to trust your product uh, and then to actually you know use your product for the, for the for the very long term. And then an another thing that I want to point out is um, before we were sort of you know limited to this um, consumer based uh, connected devices, right? Um, but then we realized you know I I, I talked with some uh, data center. Um, Brokers in the Bay Area, there are a lot of idle resources in the in the co-location centers in the Bay Area right now. You know, um, an, an ordinary data centers around a 50 to 60 percent utilization rate, which is which is a complete waste of land and electricity. Uh, and then some co-location centers were sold to Amazon Web Service last year. So you know, we th we think we can definitely take advantage of that. Um, you know, that's just uh, some of my thought, you know, developed over the past few months. Thank you for that. Okay, so you have time for one more question, and then I want to kind of leave time for you guys to all give status updates about your projects and let us know what's going on. Um, but yeah, first, I'd like to know, um, I guess, what you see as the biggest challenges uh, facing you, your team and your project as you uh, continue to build. Yeah, so yeah, actually, uh, I think as a layer two uh, project, I think uh, the biggest challenge is to have a stable layer one. So, uh, so currently during our process of building the testnet and building up our own uh, uh, like option, uh, uh, applications, what we find like uh, usually a lot of our work is involving uh, solving the instability of the uh, layer one blockchains. For example, currently we are working on the Ethereum, but a lot of times we find uh, and we are using the, uh, the the Infura as our like uh, blockchain infra. But we find like okay, somehow the Infura will like occasionally cut down our uh, connection to them. And sometimes the, 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 the blockchain infra of Infura just uh, fails to fire any kind of events that we have subscribed. 
And also, uh, as we like uh, test on the Robston test net, we found like, okay, the, the test net is so instable, like the block time could be three minutes or, or, or even more. Yeah, so it's kind of like a heavily influence like uh, our uh, user experience and also like impose a lot of burden on the layer two developers. So I think like uh, currently, I think uh, having a stable layer one for, for layer two is really like a biggest challenge. So, uh, so we're, we're also glad to see some like a project like Nervous uh, also have the similar vision. Yeah, so this is kind of like uh, the, the uh, engineering experience and the biggest challenges that we have uh, faced so far. Yeah. Hello? So when we look at our, our market, you know, we feel like there's, there's really three core groups uh, that have a strong need for improving uh, how they access their network infrastructure. And we feel like the main group is really enterprise. And the problem with enterprise is there's just a lot of inertia there. They're very hesitant, hesitant to try new technology, um, you know, especially things that are blockchain related, which is really on the bleeding edge. Um, but at the same time, there is so much value there that we think we can deliver. So we feel like it's really important to have to deliver, de develop the right use cases, develop the right metrics to prove out what we're working on. But this has really informed a lot of our design principles. So our, tech, our protocol is actually at uh, layer two and three of the OSI networking stack. And without going into too much detail about what that means, it enables us to operate with existing internet protocols without anyone having to make any code changes. So this enables a lot more of a seamless interaction with anyone that wants to use our protocol. So they can easily adopt us and we act as an overlay on top of their existing networks. And it's really easy for them to start using this. So we think that combined with, you know, working with the right pilot customers to prove out our technology can help us overcome a lot of this uh, inertia and hesitance of these enterprise companies to try new products. Um, so I would say that we have two things that we have been facing pretty much challenge in uh, when we are trying to build uh, nervous. And the first is the asset model and the second one is a virtual machine. The first asset model is like, uh, so we have designed a different asset model to, to describe uh, the user's asset. It's different from Bitcoin's UTXO model and also different from Ethereum's uh, account model. Uh, and it's uh, actually a more generalized model, we call it cell model, and it can be used to, to describe both, both kind of the, these two kinds of uh, assets. So, so building a system around this asset model is quite hard and we've been encountered a lot of problems on the road and uh, but uh, we have solved most of them and we're gonna launch the test net by the end of this year, uh, maybe January next year. And uh, the mainnet gonna be half year after that. And the second thing I mentioned is a virtual machine. So as I mentioned, we want to be supportive to all these layer two solutions. So which means we're gonna need a very powerful virtual machine to uh, to do all the calculations. So, and in our, we made a decision that we, we're gonna choose uh, RISC-5, uh, R-I-S-C-5, which was uh, uh, operation site that was originally built for hardwares. And we choose that because it's a, it's a, mo it's a very uh, basic uh, virtual machine that it's, it's using a hardware, so, uh, and we, as a layer one, we're gonna support all our layers above us. So we're gonna have to choose a very basic and simple virtual machine in our layer. And uh, and it's, it's difficult to do this because we, we have no reference uh, to uh, to implement, you know, because uh, uh, what, what we did is to, to implement this uh, virtual machine, uh, to implement a simulator in Rust, uh, Rust programming language. And it's, uh, I don't want to get into the detail, but uh, it's, it's, it's one of the challenges we are facing. Yeah, but, uh, but fortunately, we have the right guy on the team who, can, who's, uh, who has a very uh, deep ex experience in this field, and, uh, we, and he has helped us to solve this problem. Yes. OK. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, I'm not going to lie, two of them first. Is a uh, Texas is a quite uh, big project that we need to be balanced research and also engineering, and uh, Texas was one of the early uh, one of the earliest movers in the blockchain project that involved the trusted execution environment 
you know, uh, SGX is also one of it. And uh, uh, because at that time, uh, we, we built our first demo at the December last year. And uh, by that time, you know, it's not very easy to find people with the right skills. And uh, for example, if you ask uh, a question about SGX on Stack Overflow, nobody will ever answer you. And uh, only, only on their official uh, forum, you may get some answers. Yeah, and also uh, it involves a lot of, uh, uh, need, you need uh, some security background. And also, you know, uh, combined with the knowledge of blockchain. So eventually we'll find uh, some very good de developers and researchers in this area. And also another second challenge, I believe uh, mo a lot of blockchain projects also once faced. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it's about hiring the right people. So, you know, for a blockchain startup, you not only need to hire the people with the right skill, which is already, you know, combined with multiple industries, cryptography, engineering, and uh, sometimes security. And uh, also, you want them to have a right mindset. You know, uh, sometimes you just feel that peop some people really have uh, good skills, but they, lack, they, they sometimes even have bias in the blockchain industry. They feel that, uh, you know, uh, they feel that uh, uh, blockchain, scam, uh, blockchain is a scam. And uh, sometimes their family oppose them to join a blockchain startup. You know, I once told them, you know, in the early stage of internet in 1990s, if you are telling someone you are doing internet, people will give you the same answer. They think anything virtual doesn't worth money. And everything, uh, and the uh, internet was a bubble, they said. But today, how many people are still holding this opinion? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, uh, we are the early explorers of blockchain. But, and uh, yeah, so finding the right people, I think, is the uh, most challenging thing. And uh, by the way, we are hiring. <laughs> Yeah. I yeah I very much agree with uh, TF uh, for because uh, we are also you know um, leveraging Intel SGX we uh, we actually found a bug uh, in the open source uh, Intel source code uh, for uh, remote attestation and then we reported to Intel and then uh, for for almost a month uh, they wouldn't uh, accept our uh, pull request um, so that you know that's funny. Um, <laughs> And then, and then a second thing is, um, you know, it's very hard uh, for, an for an enterprise adopter to, to stake your uh, tokens. Uh, you know, it wouldn't make sense, right? Uh, so when we uh, make business development, uh, be very hard to, to attract real ad adopters uh, to, to, to use the, you know, the otherwise, you know, very, very great product. So I guess those are ch uh, some of the challenges that we face right now. And then also I very much agree with TF with, uh, with uh, talents. It's very hard in this space uh, to source good, ta good talents that will stay a very long term you know, vision with us. So yeah. Awesome. Well, I think unfortunately we're out of time. But if you want to get some updates from these guys, definitely find them after the panel. Thank you.